All right, so picking up where we left off with this thermodynamic stuff, I did make a few changes in the note, notes packet, so as we go, I'll try and point that out to you. But the last thing we did was calculate delta H minus T delta S in order to see if a reaction was thermodynamically favored as written. And of course, we were using the delta H of formation and the entropy values from our charts. And one thing I note, I told you to note was that, you know, for our elemental entities at, in their standard state, 25 degrees Celsius, one atmosphere, the delta H is zero. The entropy is not. Okay, nitrogen and hydrogen gases have entropy. And so that leads us into our third law of thermodynamics, the fact that a perfectly crystalline substance at zero Kelvin is what we set as and say has an entropy of zero. That would be the perfect particle order. And so as you slowly heat up a substance, the heat is absorbed and dispersed throughout it. And so entropy slowly, steadily increases. But you'll notice that we have some big jumps in entropy for our phase changes. So yes, when a solid, when that crystalline structure breaks down and now the particles are flowing as, as a liquid, there's a jump in entropy. And then as a liquid heats up and then the intermolecular forces are broken between particles and gases, you become independently moving particles, that's a huge jump in entropy. And so our entropy, our standard entropy values must be positive, although you will note that ions on the chart, they are in one molar solution, and hydronium has arbitrarily been set to zero. So there are some ions with a negative entropy value, but we had to set one of them equal to zero, and that would be the hydronium, although it could also be listed as the H plus ion. So now this delta H minus T delta S equation ends up being what we call Gibbs free energy, the delta G. And so you can calculate delta G by using the H and S values as we have done and we just did in the last video, but you can also use the equation and use delta G values from a table, products minus reactants, which we'll see here coming up. So as it says there, to find out if a reaction is thermodynamically favored as written, when do we need to use H, S, and G? Well, a reaction is always going to be thermodynamically favored when delta H is negative, meaning we have an exothermic reaction, and the delta S is positive, meaning we have a greater entropy change. And that, of course, can be estimated like we did the other day. Remember that a thermodynamically favored reaction, keeping our equilibrium constants in mind, that means that K is greater than 1. We would have more products in our equilibrium composition than reactants. A reaction is always not thermodynamically favored if we have a negative entropy change and an endothermic reaction. So if those two situations are happening, that would be not thermodynamically favored as written. However, remember that the reverse would be favored. And again, we note that the equilibrium constant would be less than 1. So in that situation, when it's not favored, our equilibrium composition would be predominantly reactants. Of course, there's going to be some exceptions and whatnot. Some exothermic reactions actually involve decreasing entropy, like when water freezes. We know that water sets up an incredibly organized pattern when it freezes, and so there's a decrease in entropy. Or the dissolving of some salts, like our instant ice pack salts, ammonia, I'm sorry, yeah, ammonium nitrate or sodium nitrate. So when we have those situations, oftentimes it's required that we calculate and the delta G so that we are considering both enthalpy and entropy changes. Now this slide is exactly like I had a little bit back, but delta H minus T delta S is delta G. So when delta H minus T delta S was negative, it was thermodynamically favored. Same thing here with delta G. All right. If it's positive, it's not. 
and if it's equal to zero then we have equilibrium so what you want to note is that yes the sine of delta G will explain to us whether or not something is thermodynamically favored but also the magnitude if delta G is in the negative 10 kilojoules to positive 10 kilojoules that's pretty close to equilibrium and so you would say that the mixture is going to have significant amount of reactants and products now if it's really negative then we would have a lot of products that would be equivalent to having a a large K value and if it's really positive then we would have a lot of reactants in our equilibrium mixture and that would be equivalent to having a very small K value and we will look a little deeper into this relationship between Delta G and our equilibrium constants <laughs> but I just wanted you to be aware that the size tells us something but so does the magnitude now if we have a reaction where Delta G is positive that doesn't mean it can't absolutely never happen because we can have external sources that can drive the change and make this reaction happen or a process so for example we can use electricity a rechargeable battery does not want to just spontaneously recharge itself so we use electricity and we'll talk about electrochemical processes in our last unit of the year light can also be used the Delta G for changing glucose to carbon dioxide and water is plus 2880 kilojoules so it is definitely not thermodynamically favored however when photons are absorbed specifically in the correct wavelength uh, that is required photosynthesis happens to a great extent we know that also for like AP bio people and whatnot but there's this thing called coupling of reactions like in the conversion of ATP to ADP but you can have a series of reactions that have common intermediates and then when you add up these reactions overall you get a Delta G less than zero so again we see that much more often in biochemistry cellular processes but I know there's a little article in your book about it or if you need to look that up because you're interested in it by all means go ahead and do that but it's just a reminder again that if Delta G is positive that does not mean the process cannot happen you're just gonna have to put to help that along all right, I know this looks like a lot, but if you're calculating delta G, if they ask you to calculate delta G using delta H and S, we've already done that. So here is just another example. The delta H values, remember, are in kilojoules, while entropy is in joules. So when I do my products minus reactants, I get my delta H negative 1,452.8 kilojoules. I get my delta S to be negative 161.4 joules which I do change to kilojoules so that I can go ahead and plug into my delta H minus T delta S equation and I end up with a delta G of negative 1404.7 kilojoules per mole so definitely thermodynamically favored and remember this large value means that at equilibrium we would have a significant amount of products and just take note that this is very thermodynamically favored even though we had a negative entropy change all right we went we had three moles of gas down to two so we definitely kind of expected a negative entropy change but the delta H of this reaction is so large it overpowers that and so this reaction as written ends up being very thermodynamically favored but like I said hopefully maybe they ask you to calculate Delta G using tables although I think they're leaning more towards us thinking about Delta, delta G as we will look here in a moment but you can calculate Delta G using the Delta G values from a table just like we have done H and S products minus reactants so much simpler and so you see we virtually get the same answer negative 1404.4 kilojoules per mole 
All right, so the last thing here is making sure you kind of really grasp what H, S, and G are telling us. Now, I know I made a little correction here. I had 78 there. I, I'd rather have 39. So what this means, here's the decomposition of potassium chlorate. And so the delta H of this reaction is negative 39 kilojoules per mole. So what that means, the negative, yes, exothermic and it is releasing 39 kilojoules of heat per mole of potassium chlorate that decomposes. So that's what my H is telling me. The delta S of this reaction is positive 493.9 joules per Kelvin. Yes, positive because energy is being dispersed as this potassium chlorate is decomposing. It's okay for us to say disorder is increasing because we're saying that molecular disorder is definitely increasing. A gas is the product coming from a solid. Two moles of reactant, five moles of product. Definitely a lot of increasing entropy. That's why we have a positive 493.9 joules per Kelvin. And then the last value, delta G, negative 255 kilojoules. Negative, so it is thermodynamically favored, a big number. 255, meaning that the equilibrium is composed mainly of products. We would expect a large equilibrium constant value. All right, so I hope that helps. Again, last little piece of this is looking a little more closely at the relationship between delta G and K. But otherwise, that should do it for now. See you soon.